who cares about the environment? Well, there are certainly a few companies that don't, but thankfully, there are also those that do. While some companies are sticking to the old ways of burning dinosaurs in vehicles named after dinosaurs, other companies have their sights set to the moon, to a greener future. Now, mind you, none of the examples I've shown you thus far represent this green future I'm referring to. After all, this Hummer EV you're looking at weighs over 9,000 pounds and has a battery capacity over 200 kilowatt hours. For context, that's the weight of two Ford F-150 pickup trucks and a battery capacity equivalent to five, yes, five Nissan Leafs. Which is exactly why the first time you meet a Hummer EV owner, you'll be greeted with, bro, I'm definitely not an EV guy, but you gotta admit this is cool. I'm nearly certain those will be the exact words. Hello everyone and welcome. In this video we're deep diving into the Hummer EV, a vehicle I'm not sure I've ever had such conflicting thoughts about. On one hand, it's a brilliant vehicle, wildly capable off-road, and genuinely feels like it has the ability to embarrass both the Ford Raptor and Ram TRX in any scenario. But on the other hand, it appeared on the cover of Time Magazine with a quote about engineering a greener future. I think we can all agree a vehicle that's so massive it literally doesn't require an EPA rating for energy efficiency probably isn't the best path forward, but I'll share some more math on that later in the video. And you're in for a treat in this video, as I drove with Aaron Fow riding Shotgun, the Hummer EV's lead development engineer, or as GM's media footage describes him, another bald man. Aaron offered me a detailed glimpse into the engineering of the Hummer EV. I'm confident you'll learn things here you haven't heard anywhere else. So let's start off with the powertrain. There are three 250 kilowatt electric motors, which combined gives you 1,000 horsepower and 1,200 pound-feet of torque. So despite weighing over 9,000 pounds, GM claims it'll reach 60 miles per hour in just three seconds. Worth pointing out, GM's deleting a foot of rollout here, so the actual 0-60 to 60 is more like 3.3 seconds best case. In my own testing, with a battery at about 90%, it ran a true 0-60 to 60 of 3.61 seconds. I ran it two more times back to back, with the final run hitting 60 in 3.71 seconds, so not much degradation. So for me, it wasn't as fast as GM claimed, but it had many runs before I got into the seat, and the ground did seem a little dusty. And still, 3.6 seconds is a pretty fast 60 time for a bank vault. Bank vaults are usually pretty slow, unless Dodge Chargers are involved. Now you'll notice that before the launch, the ride height is lowered. The standard ride height is about 10 inches. Launch mode drops that about 2 inches, while the off-road mode will raise the height up to about 12 inches. It's capable of nearly 16 inches for extract mode if you find yourself high-centered or navigating over tall obstacles. GMC played with different combinations of ride heights in both the front and the rear, for example with the front squatting but the rear higher up, but it turned out keeping the suspension as low as possible all around offered the best launches. Now, allowing those three electric motors to provide an absurd launch is a massive battery pack. At over 2,900 pounds, the battery pack alone weighs more than an entire Subaru BRZ. This battery has 205 kilowatt hours of energy available to use. But that's what's available. So what's the actual capacity of the battery? Uh, no one really knows except GMC. We're left to speculate based on battery math or EPA filings, which GMC won't confirm. Aaron did tell me they're not leaving a huge buffer for the battery, for example how Audi and Porsche do with their EVs, so I expect the actual capacity doesn't greatly exceed 205 kilowatt hours. Now again, this is genuinely one of the most impressive stock vehicles I've ever driven off-road, and part of that comes down to some very clever driving modes. But before we get into that, we need to talk about rear wheel steering. Not the silly crab mode, which is more of a parking lot party trick, but the fact that you have 10 degrees of rear wheel steering is game changing for off-roading, especially for vehicles of this size. When the rear wheels turn opposite the fronts, it drops the Hummer's turning circle to 37.1 feet, instead of 44.3 feet if the rear wheels were to remain straight. For reference, that's better than a Honda Civic Si. I'll include some other vehicles as well. It really makes the competition look silly. The turning circle is a full 10 feet better than the Ram TRX or Ford Raptor. Aside from making parking much easier, you know, the mall, 
There are two huge benefits off-road. First of all, if you're in an area with dense trees, tight maneuverability is highly welcome. The second is a very weird but brilliant experience. Say you're on the trail and coming up is a large rock you'd like to go around. Usually, you'd steer around it, and if space is limited, once you turn back, the inside rear tire is forced to go over the obstacle. With rear wheel steering, the rear tires actually follow the path of the front tires, meaning both front and rear will easily go around obstacles even when space is limited. Now, I mentioned crab mode being a party trick, but say things get hairy. There is a good example of how it can be a useful recovery tool, as GM experienced testing this thing at the limit. Let's say you get caught in a ditch running parallel to the path of travel. When someone's towing you out of a ditch, usually you can only turn the front wheels towards your desired direction of travel, dragging the rear along in the mud. With crab mode, you can point all four tires out of the ditch, making it easier to pull you out as you assist in the direction of travel. And if you're able to get stuck with 16 inches of ground clearance, three electric motors and front and rear lockers, congratulations on actually using your Hummer. Now, there are a bunch of drive modes, and they're not the typical gimmicky eco, normal, and sport. They're actually quite functional, but we're going to focus on the two most interesting modes, terrain and off-road. If you're a simple-brained ape like myself, you might think, don't you find terrain when you're off-road? Yes, my banana-eating friend, you do. GM says to think of terrain as a low-speed, technical driving mode, and off-road mode as a high-speed, blasting-down-the-dirt path mode. And the way they operate is completely different. Starting with terrain mode, again, our slow and precise mode, there are several key changes made. First off, terrain mode favors the mechanical brakes versus electric regen. You can drive with one pedal driving, and the mechanical brakes will slow you down as you lift off the accelerator, giving you very precise speed control. At these low speeds, electric motor regen would struggle to offer the same precision in braking feel. If you don't like one pedal driving, you can simply put your foot on the brake at any time and drive with two feet, or disable one pedal driving in the menu setting. Another very clever trick of terrain mode is that it boosts the rear steering versus the front by a factor of 1.2 times. So for example, say we have the front wheels turned 5 degrees. The rear wheels will turn opposite at 1.2 times that, or 6 degrees. Of course, this effect stops once you max out the rear wheels at their limit of 10 degrees. This helps you easily maneuver around obstacles at low speeds. It honestly makes it feel like you're cheating with how simple it is. Finally, terrain mode is the only mode in which you can activate the front differential locker, meaning the two front tire speeds are matched. It's pretty rare that you'd need it, as the front axle uses brake-based torque vectoring in any scenario where a front wheel is slipping, but it's there if you need it. Locking the rear wheels is virtual, as each have an independent motor, but you can match the speeds if you decide an upcoming obstacle might require it. Again though, you'll rarely need it, as the computers will figure out if one wheel has significantly more traction than the other. The truck is actually really smart. Smarter than it looks, unlike me in high school. At that age, you don't want to look smart. But I did. <clears throat> Back to it. Off-road mode, on the other hand, emphasizes using the electric motors for braking, rather than the mechanical brakes, unless they're required. This gives you excellent braking control when you're at high speeds, and means you're driving as efficiently as possible. The rear steering ratio is now at 0.6, meaning if the front wheels are at 10 degrees, the rears will rotate 6 degrees. Opposite the fronts at low speeds for better maneuvering, and in the same direction as the front tires at higher speeds for better stability. Now, most of our driving was at lower speeds, and I personally preferred terrain mode over off-road mode for this kind of driving. The mechanical brakes felt excellent and allowed for greater precision, and the boosted rear steering was really valuable here. But were it my own car, I'd be driving in off-road mode. It doesn't feel as good, but the huge advantage is every time you slow down, you're putting more energy back into the battery pack versus terrain mode, so it's going to give you the best efficiency and thus the best range while you're out in the middle of nowhere. And really, this mode handles the low-speed stuff just fine. So, a quick summary of capabilities. Three electric motors, independent control of each rear tire, front-locking differential, 35-inch tires and out-of-the-factory ready for 37-inch tires, nearly 16 inches of ground clearance, 13 inches of suspension travel, rear-wheel steering, properly calibrated off-road modes, one-pedal driving, 18 camera views so you can see both the inside and outside sidewalls of your tires at any time, easy-to-set air-up and air-down tire pressure targets, and an underbody decked out in thick metal protective plates. Whew. Yes, it really is ready for adventure, whether you're Baja racing or rock crawling. 
The last feature I really want to praise GMC on is the one pedal driving. It's fantastic. Some people don't like one pedal driving. Cool, don't use it. The option is there. So not only does the mode you select change the amount of regen, but you can also manually select the option between higher or lower regen within the menu, and you can select either D or L on the gear shift with L providing greater regen, and there's a steering paddle if you'd like even more regen. So you have four layers, all of which are additive of how you can manipulate the amount of regen you'd like. This ranges from very little regen up to 0.4 Gs of stopping power using motors alone, significantly higher than any other EV I know of. For example, the Nissan Leaf's one pedal regen is at 0.2 Gs, and the Audi e-tron GT stops out at 0.3 Gs for regen, though it doesn't have one pedal driving. What I love about this truck is not only does it offer a very efficient strategy, but it also allows the customer to choose what they like best. That's a beautiful thing that some <coughs> Audi, Porsche, could really learn from. Now, because I'm not an out-of-touch elite, I know Hummer owners are watching this and dying to learn about one thing and one thing only. Saving the environment. So, just for fun, let's do a comparison between the Ram TRX and the Hummer EV in terms of environmental consequences from an emission standpoint over the course of 200,000 miles. Now, granted, the Ram TRX is certainly cheaper, but the options can add up quickly, meaning both of these trucks are shining examples of how to spend over $100,000 to proudly display your insecurities to the world. So, between the Hummer EV and the Ram TRX, which is the greener option? Well, despite the Hummer EV likely having the worst energy consumption of any EV made today, it still leagues ahead of the TRX in terms of emissions, which would likely end up with 72% more carbon emissions over the course of a 200,000 mile vehicle lifetime. If you're curious how these numbers were reached, please reference the video description. But I don't want you to go away from this thinking that somehow the Hummer EV is green. I know that driving something highly resource intensive feels good for some folks, and for once, because of this brilliant product, that community might now actually have interest in an EV. So great news coal rollers, there's finally an EV that's probably worse for the environment than many combustion cars. Comparing the Hummer EV to a full size pickup like the Ford F-150 Hybrid, or a smaller pickup like the Ford Maverick, again, both of which are powered by that dirty, dirty gasoline stuff. Oh, except they both appear to have significantly lower lifetime emissions compared to the Hummer. By my math, again visit the video description for details, any gasoline vehicle that gets better than about 22 miles per gallon will actually be environmentally superior to a Hummer EV. So I guess great job. Let's remain balanced though, this isn't all completely bad news for two major reasons. First of all, this is a low production vehicle. The line of people waiting for a $100,000 EV pickup is far smaller than, say, a much more affordable pickup truck. Yeah, Ferraris are bad for the planet, but there aren't that many Ferraris. You can think of this Hummer EV as a dream truck. GMC even refers to it as the world's first all-electric super truck. It's a bedroom poster wall vehicle, not a Toyota RAV4 that fills the driveways across America. And second, this vehicle is a test bed for GM's EV technology. This is GM's modern equivalent of the moon landing. In about three years, they went from zero to a fully developed, face-melting fast super truck. Speaking with the engineers, long nights and weekends were part of the equation. All of the development, testing, and validation along the way result in powerful lessons learned for the creation of future EVs in GM stable. When you create something this complicated, something that's wildly capable on-road and off-road, at high speeds and low speeds, needs batteries and motors operating at maximum efficiency to optimize range, while having massive cooling requirements, something that can tow, rip down the drag strip, and be taken to valet for a fancy dinner, do anything and do it well, well, it makes creating a simpler product much easier. The engineers I spoke with assured me this product proved their capabilities and will be the foundation for creating mass market practical EVs, vehicles that aren't quite the same level of environmental burden as this Hummer. And from that standpoint, perhaps the investment is worth it. Unfortunately though, there's still a pretty big elephant in the room. Okay, in small tangent, the Hummer EV would technically be the bigger elephant in the room as it weighs more than an Asian elephant. Ugh, <sighs> this thing. But that's not the complaint. You see, there's a problem when you have a battery that's 205 kilowatt hours. And that problem is it takes a long time to charge it. 
And no, I'm not talking about a standard 120 volt home outlet, which by the way would take about 142 hours or nearly six full days to charge the Hummer. I'm talking about road trips. If you listen to GMC, they'll tell you about how the Hummer can charge at 350 kilowatts, meaning you can get 100 miles of range from just 10 minutes of charging. Sounds great, right? A full pack would take, what, 30 minutes? No problem. But what they don't tell you is that most fast charging stations top out at 150 kilowatts, and for stations that do offer 350 kilowatts, it's often only a single stall. So on a road trip, at least today, you're very likely going to find yourself hooked up to a 150 kilowatt charger. Say you want to charge from 10% to 85%. Very reasonable. Well, best case at 150 kilowatts, that's still slightly over an hour of waiting. A Tesla Model 3 could raise the same state of charge from 10% to 85% in a little over 20 minutes. And these are optimistic numbers for both vehicles. All of this is simply to say, if you plan on road tripping this thing, it's going to be leisurely, and you better hope you can find some 350 kilowatt chargers along the way. To close out, again, it's hard not to feel conflicted about this thing. It's not a gimmick, it's really quick, and it's really capable off-road. Plain and simple, it's very impressive to drive. The engineers who created it should be proud of this technical achievement. But it also feels like a colossal waste of resources and considering it weighs nearly as much as all three of the cars that I own combined, I sincerely hope I never meet one in a collision. But I liked it. I mean, I did. So, dang. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. Thanks for watching.